platform. We're glad to have you. We're going to wait just a few more minutes, not long. We're going to give people um, about three more minutes to come in um, and join us. So if you just be patient, we have everyone muted because we have a large crowd tonight and we thought that would make things a little bit easier um, for us. So if you just um, finish eating your dinner in two minutes, <laughs> we'll, we'll get started for real, okay? Glad to have everybody. Ruth, I'm just seeing you and Ruth, I'm just seeing you. Really? You well, should, other folks. You should see whoever, uh, if you put on gallery view, you should see everyone. That's what's wrong. If you put it on speaker view, you should see whoever's speaking. Okay, there we go. Oh, I see. It's like a, a friend of mine who just did a class, uh, a Zoom class yesterday. She was looking at everybody and she felt like it was back to romper room days. <laughs> <laughs> I see you and you and you. Uh, oh, I see someone who's had an accident. Uh, but, but you're muted and you can't tell us, Chuck. <laughs> A friend of ours is looks like he's had a little accident there but anyway so nice to see all of you hey karen uh-huh can you explain the uh, chat thing i'm going to uh okay. when i get started i'm getting wow. questions Okay, just hang on folks and here, it's, is it 6.35? We thought we'd give people five minutes to, to come in before we actually start. One more minute. Okay. All right, folks, uh, welcome to our forum tonight. We're so glad all of you could join us. My name is Karen Watson, and um, I live uh, in Dry Fork, West Virginia, just a little bit south of Canaan Valley in that area. And I'll be doing the moderating tonight um, for our forum. Uh, Ruth Bullwinkle is, if you can see her, uh, she's next to me. She is our tech, our host, and she's been letting all of you in to the meeting. And I'll go ahead and introduce Ru Ruth. She's um, a pastor with St. John's Ep Episcopal <laughs> Lutheran Church in Davis, West Virginia. And she, we're so happy that she's a member of our group, which I'll tell you more about in just, just a few minutes, um, the group that's sponsoring this forum. Um, but we are recording this, the presentations. I wanted to let people know that right up front in case you want to um, uh, stop your video if you don't want to be shown uh, on the recording. Uh, when we get to the question and answer session, we are going to stop recording, though, because we want everyone to feel free to um, pose their um, questions and have a good discussion without fear of, of uh, uh, being seen. Um, so anyway, the title of our forum tonight is A New Look at the History of Race in West Virginia and Tucker County's Own American Hero, Carrie Williams. Um, we're happy you've joined us. We know you could be doing other things tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone's busy. Uh, we need to have everybody muted. Ruth, I think. Okay. 
Um, but uh, we had about 83 people register for this. So we we're very happy about that. I don't know if we know right now about how many people have signed up. Um, 57, I see. So we're doing, doing pretty well, but um, for our first form, we're real happy that you have registered. It just shows the degree of interest in this subject, uh, I, I think. I do wanna recognize a few people who are with us tonight. Um, we have uh, Ben Vester, who is, and if you, if you wanna, if you're, if you're showing your video and you wanna hold your hand up, feel free. Um, he is the regional coordinator for Senator Manchin. Uh, we, Senator Manchin has a, a video that we're going to show you in just a minute. Um, and Mr. Vester uh, works out of the Fairmont area. And he was very instrumental in, in helping Senator Manchin uh, with the video that we're going to show you. So welcome, Ben. Uh, we also have at least one member of our House of Delegates, Danielle Walker. She's present um, and uh, we're real pleased to have her. Um, she's one of three black delegates uh, serving in our House of Delegates in Charleston. Um, and uh, she might possibly be a future speaker for us someday. But thank you for coming, Danielle. And if I've missed any other delegates that I'm not aware of, we, we welcome you too. Um, we also have people from the Davis Town Council and the Thomas Town Council as well. And we're really glad you can join us because it's important for uh, the local governments to, to work with us on, on the various uh, issues that we have. Um, Savannah Wilkins, our new prosecutor. She was just elected in November. She's joining us tonight. So welcome, Savannah. Uh, then we, we have people just from lots of, lots of you individual citizens. And we have um, the NAACP represented, the ACLU, um, uh, and um, uh, local churches. We also have the artist who painted the Carrie Williams mural on Buxton and Land Street on that building, which you'll hear a little bit more about in the presentation. Um, <clears throat> so I wanna real quick mention our next forum, just in case you have to drop off uh, sooner than we actually end the meeting, but if we understand uh, time commitments. Our next forum is gonna be in two months, April, 20th, so mark your calendars. It's uh, going to be sort of a little more history, but mostly it's going to segue into uh, the history of racist policies that we've had in this country and how that's uh, causing current impacts on policies. Um, we have Kitty Dooley, a Charleston attorney, going to join us uh, as a speaker, and our own Karen Jacobson, who lives um, on Laneville Road. She's the executive director of the Randolph County Housing Authority. So she's gonna be speaking about that. Um, so please join us April 20th, we hope you can. I wanna just briefly mention, I'm sorry for hurrying, but we wanna get on to our speakers. I wanna mention that the group that is sponsoring our forum tonight is the Tucker County for Racial Equality Group. We are a group of local citizens who after the George Floyd and Breonna Taylor killings uh, were very, very concerned about the degree of racism that still exists in our society. And we've started meeting together. Um, and one of my introductions was going to be of Al Schneider. She is um, uh, helping us uh, as a, a co-host tonight. And she was one of the co-founders of the group um, so Al, thank you so much. And we're finally getting to be out here with the public. We started out the, for all these months, we've just been having private meetings and uh, trying to learn as much as we can. We have a book club, um, but we decided we wanted to share what we've been learning and just, just uh, invite the community to learn with us. So that's the purpose of these forums. Uh, we're glad you're here. Our agenda tonight uh, will show the um, video, the welcome video that Senator Manchin prepared. 
then I'll introduce the first speaker, uh, who is Tom Rod, and he will speak for about 20 minutes uh, about West Virginia and, and the role that um, uh, African Americans have played um, in, and also J.R. Clifford. And then I will introduce Kathy Costantini, and she will be speaking um, about Carrie Williams more specifically. I, I'll introduce her. Um, then we'll have our Q&A. I want to tell you about the Q&A. Because we have so many of us, we thought we would uh, have you direct your questions in the chat room. If you're familiar with these Zoom calls, you, if you need any help, just um, maybe you can raise your hand, but there's a chat uh, option. And in this case, you want to direct your chats to me, to Karen Watson, because you also have Al Schneider there and Ruth Bullwinkle, but they are busy doing other things. Um, I am looking at the questions and my husband, Rick, is sitting beside me and he's going to help me filter through the questions. So um, make sure when you do a chat, you click on my name, okay? And that way we'll get your question and, and be able to um, ask that of our, of our speakers. Um, and uh, we, like I said, we're recording, we're keeping folks muted. Um, and now we will get started. So I'm ready to introduce the uh, Senator Manchin's video, Ruth. Um, let me just say that Senator Manchin has served in the Senate for West Virginia as our senior, senior senator since November of 2010. He um, is uh, now that the Democrats are in um, control of the Senate, he will be the new chair of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. He also serves on three other very important committees. He came to my, uh, or it came to my attention last year that he really is passionate about uh, racial justice issues. When I heard his, he had two uh, forums he sponsored, his office sponsored, called From Hurt to Healing, and they were excellent. And he, he um, cares a, a lot about this issue. So he, we're very happy that he prepared a video uh, welcoming us. So with that, Ruth, if you um, can turn our video on. I'm having technical difficulties. <laughs> Hang on, I've got a, it didn't pop up. Hang on. Hang with us, guys. This is, uh, this, all this Zoom technology is. Should we have one of the others, Al, or we try to share, show it? Ruth, you think? Yeah, it's not working on mine. The Dropbox won't share. Al, Al do you have it handy? Uh, I have it, I think, if I can. I, yeah, I have it. Um, share, I have to hit share screen first. Yeah. So I have it up if uh, if you have trouble with the screen share, Karen, but um, I need to be made a, oh wait, maybe I am a, here. Um, I need to be made a co-host as the one where you can see my face. Uh, the one where I'm talking from is my phone. So if Ruth is able to do that. Okay, let me find you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Oh, it's fun to see everybody's uh, paintings and colorful blankets on their couches and box <laughs> pictures behind the folks there. Okay, make co-host. Yes. Is that the right one? No. Okay, let me let me try it, folks. Okay, may I? Sure. Share screen. Let me see. 
Let me find your design. Uh, no, it says you've disabled my screen share. <laughs> How do I do that? <laughs> oh, folks, I'm sorry. Just hang in there another minute. And if, if we can't get it, we'll have to move on. I'm looking for the Center for Design. It's not that one, Ruth. I changed my name. Oh, you did? Oh. I just sent you a message. Wait. I'm sorry. Can, can Ruth not enable us? It's Al they them. Okay. Meet co host. All right. Okay. Okay. There we go. Hello, I'm Senator Joe Manchin, and it is a privilege to welcome you to this important event where we will look at the history of race in West Virginia. I appreciate each of you for coming together as a group to discuss this important issue. Much like Tucker County's own Carrie Williams and her fight for equal rights in the Jim Crow era, we must continue the legacy of confronting injustice when we see it and working to prevent it in the future with compassion, knowledge, and fortitude. As we know, the past year has been a tremendous challenge for many reasons. In addition to the pandemic, we have witnessed tragedies of grave injustice that brought systematic racism to the forefront in our nation once again. Learning from our past is a large step in the right direction, and coming together in our communities for programs like this one are a large step forward to where we need to be. Even the smallest group can make a huge impact on a community. We must continually search for ways to move forward to a more equal and just society. I thank the members and supporters of Tucker County for racial equality as well as today's speakers, Tom Murad, Kathleen Constantini, for making today's seminar possible. Thank you for my, inviting me to be part of today's event. Please enjoy the rest of today's important program, and God bless you all. Thank you. All right, thank you, Senator Manchin. Um, okay, we'll move on to our first speaker now. Uh, he's given the thumbs up there. Tom, our, our first speaker is Tom Rod. He is an, a retired attorney. He lives in Preston County. Um, he uh, and Larry Starcher, State Supreme Court Justice Larry Starcher in 2004 began the J.R. Clifford Project to celebrate the life of West Virginia's first African-American attorney. And you'll see how instrumental he was in the Kerry Williams case. I mean, he was he was Kerry Williams' attorney. Um, and uh, Mr. Rod is the author of a middle school book and two historical dramas uh, about West Virginia's civil rights history. Uh, we're very happy to have you with us here today, Tom. Take it away. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Good, good. You know, it, these, uh, I, I feel like I should have an Indiana Jones hat on. Uh, I'm sure I have one around the house somewhere because these Zoom programs are still somewhat of an adventure for me. But I just hit share screen and uh, I want to put up the first slide from my slideshow today. Can you see that slide up there? Excellent. All right, let's go to the beginning then. Basically, that's what I'm going to do is uh, do a slideshow with you. And I wish I was at the Opera House in uh, downtown Thomas, West Virginia, and able to see your heads nodding. We have to do this over Zoom. So I'm making a, a conscious effort to look into the camera as if I were talking to you all personally. But I do have a script here, and I'm limited to 20 minutes. So I'm going to reach over and get my iPhone and uh, hit the clock and look for the stopwatch and press it start and i promised you that when that says 20 minutes wherever i am in this script i'm gonna stop uh this is 
a program uh, brought to you by the J.R. Clifford Project, which is a project of Friends of Blackwater, which I serve on the board of. And I'm going to let go to the next slide right away. I want to say that I need to thank two people whose work I've drawn on for this program. On the left is uh, WVU historian Dr. Connie Rice. And on the right is Marjorie Clifford McDaniel. She's a Clifford Kent family member. Uh, can, are you hearing me okay? Well, I assume that the answer is yes, so I'm gonna continue. Uh, I also wanna thank Supreme Court Justice Larry Starcher, the fellow with the white beard in this photo, and attorney Kitty Dooley, the woman in the white suit, who are my partners with the J.R. Clifford Project. And we'll skip in. My talk today is some facts about uh, the history of slavery and white supremacy in West Virginia, particularly the area around Tucker County. And I want to talk a little background, a little people, and we might get, have time to get to some outcomes. Uh, this next slide and the one following it uh, are images of enslaved Africans on their way to the New World, a process that began in the 1600s. Slave children were especially valuable because they took up less room in the slave ships. This is a map of the state of West Virginia in 1860, just before West Virginia was created. It shows the absolute numbers of the slaves in each county. And the black population of Virginia in 1860 was about 550,000 people, and about 58,000 of those were classified as free people of color. And in what is now West Virginia, there were about 10,000 enslaved people and about 2,000 what were called free people of color. And here's another map that shows the percentage of the population in these counties that of the people there who were enslaved. This map shows something that is a part of the American slavery story that's not too widely understood. The top map shows the distribution of enslaved people in 1790, when North American slavery had been going on for about 150 years. In 1808, the US Congress outlawed the African slave trade, but the domestic trade in slaves flourished. The enslaved population in the United States nearly tripled over the next 50 years. And by 1860, look at the map below at the bottom, it had reached nearly 4 million people. The price of a slave tripled in those 50 years before the Civil War. More than 1 million enslaved people in the upper south states like Virginia were sold south to labor on the cotton plantations. Caravans or coffles of chained slaves were common sight on the roads of what is now West Virginia. Families were torn apart and children were ripped from their parents. And slave people rebelled and risked death to escape to the free states in the north. But circumstances became worse as well for the free people of color who remained in the state of Virginia. Free people of color had no rights. They couldn't travel without a pass. They had no access to schooling and they were often persecuted for helping escaped slaves. Now I want to talk about a community of free people of color, move from that background to some people, a community of free people of color in the Clifford family who were centered just to the east of Tucker County in a small community called Williamsport. Williamsport was then in Hardy County, West Virginia. Now if you look at this map you can see that Thomas and Davis, and then you head east. If you're looking from the east and you get over to that area around uh, Williamsport, look through Shear and Maysville and all that. Anyhow, I'm from this so I better get back to it. The Kent Clifford family were centered in this small community called Williamsport. It was then in Hardy County, Virginia, and it's now in Grant County. And the in, the 1790 Hardy County Census said there were 1790, 369 enslaved persons in Hardy County and 411 free persons of color. At that time, that was the only county in Virginia that had more free people of color than slaves. Uh, here from the Kent Clifford Family Reunion webpage, and we'll have more of that in a moment. 
Here's uh, one of the most prominent members of the Kent Clifford family, uh, the publisher, educator, and lawyer, J.R. Clifford. He was born in Williamsport, that little town we just saw, 1848. J.R.'s father, Isaac Clifford, and his mother, Kent Clifford, are buried in this cemetery. It's the Green Hill Cemetery near Williamsport. This, that's a picture of the gate. This is a roadside view of the cemetery. Now let's take a look at a few of the individuals who were buried in the Green Hill Cemetery, and it was quite a fun task to uh, put this together. Uh, here's Isaiah Bruce, born 1895, just up the road in Medley. Virginia Beckwith, born 1899. Here's another person, Ashley Beckwith, from that same generation. Here's a couple other photos that have been posted by relatives on the Green Hill Cemetery website. It's about an hour and a half east of Thomas and Dave, east of Tucker County. The, the Kent Clifford lineage is not all in the ground, though. Uh, for Here's the family reunion. They have them every two years, and every other year meeting is in the Williamsport region. Here's another reunion. I want to show you a couple of pictures of uh, people who had a special connection to our J.R. Clifford project. This is J.R. Clifford's niece, the late Frida B. Rolls. She was born in Williamsport and she was eight years old in 1933 when her uncle John Clifford J.R. passed away. Uh, Frida remembered J.R. from family gatherings and I had the honor of putting her as a character in one of our reenactments. Here's a picture of her daughter, daughter Karen, who passed away last year. She and her sister have been very supportive of our project. How am I doing for time here? So look at my, I got seven minutes into this. Oh, I think we're doing good. All right, let's keep going. This is another person who passed away recently. She was born in Davis in Tucker County in 1932, and she attended the Coakton Colored School just down the street from where Friends of Blackwater has their office. And she graciously shared her memories with our project. And in this slide, the fellow handsome fellow on the right is Chuck Green, her son, who is married to the attorney Kitty Dooley on the left, who was in one of our Clifford projects. Here's another one of the Kent Clifford family members, the scholar Henry Lewis Gates. He was at, at one of our reenactments. He was raised in the town of Piedmont in Mineral County near Kaiser, where a lot of the Kent Clifford folks from the Williamsport area moved when as that area developed. Here's the community to where Kent Clifford people moved. And this might look familiar to our Tucker County people. This is um, the Rose Hill Cemetery in the town of Thomas, where Frank, Friends of Blackwater has their offices. And if you look at the, uh, down the hill there, you see the town of Thomas and there's Rose Hill up uh, near uh, Cortland Acres Nursing Home. Okay, here's uh, a headstone in the Rose Hill Cemetery for John Henson Clifford, who was J.R. Clifford's younger brother, or more specifically his half-brother, because after J.R.'s mother passed away, his father, Isaac, remarried John Henson Clifford's mother. Now, John Henson Clifford was a teacher, like Kerry Williams, in, the, I think, Tucker County, teaching the African-American kids whose parents worked in the coal, coke, and railroad industries. Okay, let's catch our breath. We got uh, a few minutes left, so I'm going to move on to the next section of this presentation. So we looked at some background, we looked at some people, and uh, I'm going to compress the history pretty radically. We'll take our breath back here in Williamsport again. Uh, and we'll cover some a few outcomes related to the broader history of the state of West Virginia. All right, J.R. Clifford, raised in Williamsport on the farm, but uh, during the Civil War, his parents uh, decided for his safety and whatever other reasons to send him to Chicago, where he lived with family friends and he attended a school. So he leaves the farm, he goes to Chicago, and in 1864, at age 15, J.R. Clifford of Hardy County, West Virginia, enlisted in the of Virginia 
Well, no, West Virginia had, had been created by them. So uh, he enlisted in the Union Army anyhow, and he trained at Camp Nelson in Kentucky. There were more than 200,000 black soldiers who enlisted in the Union Army, like J.R. And this was these black soldiers celebrating the Union victory. And as you can imagine, these soldiers felt that their military service had finally earned them full citizenship. And nothing was more central to that citizenship than the right to vote. And in the years immediately after the Civil War, uh, African-American men voted for the first time in large numbers throughout the former Confederacy. Here's another image from the time. Now, in the new state of West Virginia, voting rights for African-Americans and for former Confederates were finally established in about 1870. But in many states of the former Confederacy, there was a Jim Crow backlash against black voting rights that went on for generations. And by around 1900, voting was denied to most blacks in the former Confederate states. Uh, here's an amazing example uh, from the year 1920. Um, poor whites were also discriminated against by those restrictions. Uh, this, look at how many people were voting for congressional representation in South Carolina, 25,000, compared to West Virginia, where uh, it was more than 200,000, or Nebraska. South Carolina was in the democracy. It was a racist oligarchy where uh, poor whites and blacks were just left out of the electorate. So the South was just wretched on black voting. Black leaders, like Washington, counseled accepting that, but others just agreed. And here in the center picture, we can see is one of the leaders of those people, J.R. Clifford with William E. Du Bois at Storer College in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia. Uh, these were leaders of the Niagara movement, black men and women who fought back against disfranchisement. Now I'm sitting here and I know I need to look we've got 12 minutes into this. I think I'm going to make it through my script. So hang in there as we play this voting rights story out because West Virginia is really an interesting story in that regard. Uh, J.R. Clifford, uh, William E.B. Du Bois, and many women who were also leaders in the movement uh, fought back against disfranchisement, and those were really the forerunners of the NAACP. By the way, this is uh, J.R. Clifford's daughter, Mary Clifford, just a wonderful photo. She was a student for her college in Harpers Ferry, and I just want to include it in this program. Okay, here's a pretty interesting map. Now, this is the Eastern Panhandle where J.R. Clifford practiced law. Uh, this map shows the three easternmost counties of West Virginia and the three adjoining Virginia counties. All of these counties were part of Virginia before 1863, and they all have significant black populations. And if we run the numbers over 60 years, and to my knowledge, I'm the only person who's actually done this research, uh, but it's really, really quite instructive. On average, West Virginians voted in twice the numbers as their neighbors in the Old Dominion. Isn't it? Look at the look at the disparities between these uh, these states in terms of how what percentage of their population is voting in these uh, elections, presidential elections. That's because Virginia's post Civil War laws to prevent black voting worked and worked and worked to make a mockery of the idea of democracy for generations. And for West Virginia's at that time, on March 16th and 17th, T. Edward Hill of the McDowell Times met with J.R. Clifford in Martinsburg to discuss what role African-Americans should take in the fall election and the impact the election could have on the black community. The man issued a statement saying, we represent more than 25,000 voters who have a stake in all that is dear to us as men in a free government. In other words, democracy was well in West Virginia while it had been ripped away in the old dominion. Discussions at the meeting centered on how to protect the interests of the 64,000 African Americans living in the state. The men concluded that African Americans held the balance of power in 14 counties. 
So it's got an interesting West Virginia politics. I highlighting perhaps one of the only reasons why creating West Virginia was such a good idea, uh, if indeed it was. So uh, we give credit for to, this is J.R. Clifford Country from uh, Kentucky, where he trained, to uh, Petersburg, where he fought as a soldier, and uh, Rose Hill Cemetery in Thomas, where half brothers buried. And here's where J.R. Clifford and his wife Mary Franklin uh, were buried in the Mar they were originally buried in the Martinsburg Cemetery. Now that their remains were transferred to the Arlington National Cemetery, it's always an honor to tell any portion of the story of the life of J.R. Clifford and some of this interesting West Virginia history. So, thanks for your patience, and I hope you enjoyed it. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Tom. That was fascinating, and you and you beat your time. <laughs> thank you for respecting our time. We appreciate that. But no, fascinating content. Okay, well, our second speaker is um, Kathleen Costantini. We welcome you, Kathy. Um, she is the author of a recently published book, two thousand, just in two thousand nineteen called An Allegheny Triumph of Justice, uh, Carrie Williams' Courageous Fight for Equal Rights in the Jim Crow Era. And that's uh, published in uh, uh, Charleston, West Virginia. We'll tell you more, remind me later about uh, if you're interested in, in um, how to get her book. Uh, she has over 25 years experience as a teacher and administrator and a college advisor in diverse urban school settings. Throughout her career, she has taught advanced placement courses in U United States history and American government and politics. She currently lives in New York and she is frequently in the mountain state. She was formerly our next door neighbor. Um, for those of you who know where we live, she and her partner lived right across the street from us. Um, so anyway, Kathy, we're happy to have you here. So. Oh, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here and to share my experiences um, exploring the story of Carrie Williams. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Tom Rod and the J.R. Clifford Project and to express how indebted I feel both to him and to Dr. Connie Park Rice their research is tremendous, and um, especially in the writing of the book, I was in contact with Tom and his wife, Judy, many times. So I'm very happy to be involved in this. Um, I, you're looking at the Copeton Colored School historical marker. This was when I first learned about Carrie Williams, and anyone who knows me, um, especially my poor children, we, when we travel, we stop at every historical marker. And when I looked at this marker, I was amazed that I had never heard of this case. That day began a journey of exploration for me. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. This is a slide that has the mural of Carrie that's painted on the wall. Do we have that slide? Uh, well, I'll keep going, but it's uh, hang on, I'll find it. Okay. okay. I, it wasn't forwarding. Let me do something else here. <laughs> wait, wait one minute, Kathy. And by the oh. way, while, what, sorry to interrupt you, Kathy. While we're taking a break, I'm sorry, uh, I, we had a problem in the chat room, but now you should be able to send your questions directly to me, Karen Watson. Okay. Um, okay. Now. Okay, now this beautiful mural was done by Allie Prince very recently, and it's really a wonderful rendition. And when I first saw, I wasn't able to go to West Virginia because of COVID, but when I first saw this picture, I just thought how Carrie would feel after having shopped in the Buxton and Land Street store with company script, and now her mural, this beautiful mural, by Ellie Prince is on the outside of the building. 
Now, what was so striking to me as I explored Carrie's story was the way that so many people came together to make this court case a victory. First of all, there's Carrie. And she was unafraid to go up against the strongest political, social, and economic entity in her world, Davis Cole and Coke Company. Then we have J.R. Clifford, her lawyer. Clifford is a, a civil rights attorney that everyone in this country should know about. So far ahead of his times. Then we have Judge Hoke. Now, Judge Hoke was so important in the passage of the 15th Amendment when he was a senator in the West Virginia Senate. Later, and he also secured the charter for Storer College to educate African Americans. Now, added to this is the jury of ordinary citizens who listened to the evidence and sided with Carrie and their African American neighbors. All of this supporting the fundamental principle of the rule of law. So what I would like to do now is to start with Carrie. Uh, we don't know a lot about Carrie, but she was born Carrie M. Edwards in Chillicothe, Ohio. That city in itself is important because it had a vibrant black free community. It was also important in manning stations on the Underground Railroad. Her parents, Jacob and Rachel, were both from Virginia, but again, we don't know if they were free or slave. What we do know is that Carrie was educated, achieved a normal school diploma, which enabled her to become a teacher, and that she taught for a number of years in Ohio, but as West Virginia was experiencing such a black population growth, the state needed more African American teachers. Carrie came to West Virginia. We do know that on November 20th, 1889, she married her husband, Abraham, in Thomas, West Virginia. Abraham was born in 1861 in Mineral County. Carrie and Abraham had nine children. Now, prior to the court case, we know that Carrie had taught for nearly 10 years in Ohio and several years at the Copeton Colored School. So uh, can we move to the next slide? Uh, what I wanted to talk about next was Thomas and Copeton. So the picture of the Davis Coal and Coke miners. Okay, the reason I wanted to talk about Thomas and Copeton, they were the two of the largest of the cities in the Fairfax district. Uh, we don't have it yet. <laughs> um, I'll go on uh, while I we're waiting. Freezing. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm going to continue a little because we don't actually need that slide. But here, Henry Gassaway Davis centered his far reaching corporate empire. He owned 135,000 acres of coal rich land there were a total of approximately 6,500 people in Tucker County, according to the 1890 census. He employed 2,500 of these men, and of the 2,500 men that he employed, they were people who spoke 18 different uh, languages. Now, if you look at the picture here, you can see the Davis colon Cove Coke miners. And if we move to the next picture, these are the Coke ovens. Now, most of the African American population lived in Coketon, the central mining and facility, and also the headquarters of DC and C. 
Now, these nine coal mines and nearly 1,000 coke ovens operated nearly 250 days a year. Now, if we can look at the next slide. The next slide is a picture of the West Virginia Central and Pittsburgh Railroad. Okay, the reason that that is so important is like Davis Coal and Coke, Henry Gasway Davis was the prime principal owner of the West Virginia Central and Pittsburgh Railroad. This was key getting the coal and coke to the urban centers, particularly Pittsburgh, for the production of steel. Okay, I think we're back to the coke ovens. Um, okay, if now if we could go to the right, the, this is the slide, the Buxton and Land Street Company Store. It's an impressive, beautiful building. Today, this is where the gallery is, and Carrie's mural is on the side of this building. So this is where the, the um, workers would go and spend their salary, which was paid in company script. And if we can have the wider angle picture, we're looking, you can see on the right is the B&L store. The building on the left is Davis Coal and Coke headquarters. And you have the wider view of Copeton and Thomas. Now, the reason that I wanted to show you these pictures is that Prosperity and Thomas and Copeton in fact, all of the Fairfax district, Tucker County, was really dependent on the Davis Coal and Coke Company. And this only underscores Carrie's bravery in deciding to confront um, an all white school board that was basically controlled by Davis Coal and Coke. Now, despite a vote by the citizens of Tucker County to fund an eight month school term, the all white Board of Education decided to reduce the school year to five months for the African American children while retaining the eight month contract uh, calendar for the white students. And clearly, the school board did not anticipate any serious resistance. After all, Davis Cole and Coke that basically controlled the school board, paid their wages and provided their housing. Okay, now, however, the school board is going to encounter a very strong woman, strong, determined, Carrie Williams. Now, at the time, Carrie was 26 years old, the wife of a coal miner, the mother of two children and pregnant with her third. And rather than being intimidated, Carrie decided to challenge this court order, this school board order. The first step is that Carrie refused to sign her contract. Instead, she sought out counsel. Now, if I could have the next picture, this is of J.R. Clifford. Now, Tom Rod has already spoken to you about J.R. Clifford. Um, J.R. Clifford was the perfect attorney for this. He was so far ahead of his times in understanding the importance and the original intention of the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection of the Law Clause. He was eager to I argue this case. So Carrie and Clifford, um, Carrie it follows Clifford's advice which is not to sign her contract, which Carrie had already refused to do, and to teach the full eight month calendar. And knowing that she would not receive any pay after the fifth month, uh, Clifford's advice was to live on their savings. Now, the school board allowed Carrie, and this is very important, the school board allowed Carrie to teach the five month calendar without a signed contract. 
She received her $40 a month. Um, however, at the end of the five months, the payments stopped. At that point, Harold Meyer, who was secretary of the school board, came to Carrie and asked for her class register. Carrie refused to give it to Harold Meyer and told him that she intended to continue teaching. Uh, Meyer advised her, you will not be paid and that a dollar would be withheld from her final payment for failure to hand in the class register. So over the next three months, Carrie did not receive any payment. And as Clifford had suggested, the family lived on their savings. Now at the end of the eight months, school's over, Carrie sought payment for the final three months only to be rejected by the school board. Now the stage is set for legal action. Um, I'm going to be showing you two slides because this document is in two segments. Harold, uh, when Harold Meyer learns of Clifford representing Carrie, he, can I have the next slides please? When um, Harold Meyer hears that Clifford is representing uh, Carrie, he writes her a letter and notice that it's on Davis Coal and Coke Company stationery. In this letter, he basically advises Clifford to get his fee, his, his lawyer's fee in advance because this was going to be an unsuccessful lawsuit. What he was really at telling Clifford is, you may get the anger of Davis Cole and Coke Company if you continue, continue with this lawsuit. Clifford was not intimidated. And in November of 1893, Clifford filed a lawsuit on behalf of Perry Williams, claiming that the Fairfax School Board at, owed her $120 for the three months that she had taught, plus the $1 left that subtracted from her final payment for her failure to hand in the class register. However, this case took two full years to arrive before a judge. Now here again, I would like to credit Tom Rod for unearthing the transcript of this trial. And I, in my book, I credit Tom and I take a lot of the actual testimony from the transcript. So thank you again, Tom. Now, um, the next slide, uh, next, Ruth, okay, this is the end of the day, the letter from Meyer. And now this is Judge Hoke. Hoke was, to me, a very amazing man. I'm from Michigan originally. And he went to college at Hillsdale College in Michigan, and he went to law school at University of Michigan. Um, and Judge Hoke, as I mentioned before, he had been very involved in the passage of the 15th Amendment and getting, gaining the charter for Storer College. He also remained on at Storer College as a long-term trustee. He knew the value of education for African Americans. Now, what I'd like to do is we have the trial. The list of witnesses is short. It's only two people, Carrie Williams and Harold Meyer, the secretary of the Board of Education. However, before I sum up their testimony, I just would like to summarize the arguments that both lawyers are presenting. First of all, Strebe, the lawyer for the Board of Education, is basing his argument that Carrie had no contract, so therefore she was not entitled to any pay. In other words, his entire focus is on contract law. Clifford is while he is suing for back pay for Carrie, what he is really suing about is West Virginia law 
that requires equal education. Although the schools are segregated, they must be equal. Now, in the witness testimony, Carrie is called first. And Carrie's testimony reveals her understanding of West Virginia law. She admits, no, I did not have a written contract. And because it was only for five months, she testifies she would not sign it. What she was seeking was what she says repeatedly, a fair and legal education for her students. Now, in Strebe's cross-examination, he confirms she, the meeting that Carrie had with Meyer earlier and how she would not sign her contract and that she knew she would not be paid for the remaining three months. Carrie agrees to that. Then he talks about the, Strebe asks her about the class register. Here at this point, Carrie produces the class register. Now, rather than handing it over to Strebe, she starts to read. Now, if I could have the slide of the class register. And you'll see, this is a monthly summary of what Carrie did in each of those months that she taught. That's why she wouldn't hand in the register. The school year was not over for Carrie after five months. Um, and again, Carrie's testimony review, reveals her understanding of West Virginia law, that her students are entitled to a fair, and she repeatedly uses the word legal education. Um, now, again, with Carrie, with the register or the monthly summary, uh, Clifford moves to have that introduced into evidence so that the jury can consider it in their um, jury deliberations. Now, the next witness is Harold Meyer. Remember that he's secretary of the Board of Education, but when he introduces himself, he introduces himself first as the vice president of Davis Coal and Coke Company, then as secretary of the school board. Now, when Clifford questions Meyer, he ascertains for the jury that the school board sets the property taxes that fund the school year, both for white and colored schools. So why a shorter year for the colored students? Meyer response, responds with, it was simple arithmetic. The number of, they calcul calculated the number of white children and the number of colored children. There were less colored, so their share only allowed for five months of education. Uh, Clifford then goes on to say, well, why not raise the property taxes? And Meyer's response is that that would be highly irregular. Clifford also ascertains that Davis Cole and Coke pays most of the property taxes. Now, in their closing arguments, Clifford's arguments go to the heart of the case. The issue was simple. Should, must the school board follow the law of West Virginia that required equal school terms for white and colored schools in the same district? Even if that means that the Davis Coal and Coal Company will pay more. Uh, Clifford goes on to say, Carrie had abided by the law because she taught the full year and earned her salary every day of that year. It's the school board that deviated from the law. Streepy, his closing argument goes back to contract law. He stressed that this, this was totally a case about contract. Carrie had no contract and therefore she was not entitled to back pay. 
The jury found in favor of Carrie in the amount of $120. Um, Streeby announces that he plans to appeal and Judge Hope puts Carrie's $120 in an interest bearing account until the appeal is decided. Now, can I have the next slide, please? This is a slide of Judge Marmaduke Dent, who is on the West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals, and he will write the majority opinion in this case. Okay, again, Clifford argues that the lower court's decision should stand, and he deals with the contract issue saying, first of all, that schools could waive work without a contract. Secondly, he goes into the more important issue. The laws of West Virginia justified Carey's not signing the contract because it violated the West Virginia constitution calling for separate but equal schools. Streeby's argument rested totally on contract. Carrie had no contract, therefore she deserved no back pay. Now, after hearing both sides, judges deliberated and there, five months later on November 16th, 1898, the West Virginia Supreme Court upheld the lower court's decision. Now, in the majority opinion, Judge Dent says it's too late to say you worked without a contract after the board had accepted Carrie's work for five months. Dent then looked at the unequal terms. And he said, first of all, under West Virginia law, the number of the school population in that area was 26 African-American children. That mandated a primary school and a primary school that would have the same term as the white schools. What the school board had done was to give the pro rata or proportional share to the black children of the taxes. And that funding was incorrect. It was a direct violation of West Virginia law. And Justice Dent then went on to address some of the underlying racial implications of the case and said very clearly, if any discrimination should be made as to education, it should be favorable to not against the colored people. Now, if I could see the next slide, please. This is a historical marker in front of the, in Parsons, in front of the courthouse. And I just came back to that because this case has such far reaching implications. It's the first case in the United States to determine that discrimination based on race alone is illegal. It guaranteed an equal school term for African-American children in Copeton, and it set the standard for the entire state of West Virginia. It also established pay parity for their teachers and impacted black migration to West Virginia because West Virginia was a state where African-American children had a fair shot at education. Now, can I have the next slide? Um, this is one of my favorite slides, Dolly Sods. And I always think of this when I think about this jury of ordinary citizens from atop the uh, Allegheny Mountains, sides with Carrie Williams, and they make this resounding statement affirming the rights of their African-American neighbors. I think it's so important that despite the legalization of second-class citizenship in the Jim Crow era, West Virginia stood alone amidst the Southern and the former border states. 
adding this distinctly positive note um, in the history of Black education, in the history of Black civil rights, this case is a resounding beacon of hope. And so and I want to conclude by saying that I think the victory, I love J.R. Clifford and I love the jury and I love Judge Hoke. But to me, the victory is ultimately to carry. What emerges in her story is the portrait of a strong woman, unafraid to challenge the most powerful economic, political entity in her world in order to achieve a fair and legal education for her own children, for her students, present and future. So I applaud the state of West Virginia. Thank you very much. And I hope I did not go over my 20 minutes. Uh, no, thank you, Kathy. That was fascinating. Yes, really, really you broke down thank that trial. You. Like, <laughs> really, and your passion, your passion for the subject affects us all. Um, and we can be proud of our West Virginia Supreme Court. Oh, absolutely. At that point in the time, yeah. I, I was telling Karen, I have to confess, I was telling Karen that I'm used to captive audiences. When you have students and you're up there in front of the class, um, you can go on <laughs> and on. It's yeah. really, and I respect that I only had 20 minutes, so I was trying very hard. <laughs> well, Kathy, um, uh, let me pose the first question we have um, that just came in. Um, it's uh, or Tom, if either of you know. Um, let me go to it. Um, wait a minute. Closed it. <laughs> Where's uh, I would, no. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, do you, do we know who was on the jury and who did they work for? Do we know that? Um, I'm going to defer to Tom primarily on this because we talked about this the other day that you had the jury pool, but the jury would have been from the citizens of Tucker County, but Tom is the one that unearthed the case. So. Okay, Tom, excuse me, before you answer, Tom, um, uh, Ruth, just a reminder, have you turned the recording off? Uh, we, we're, beginning the, we're beginning our question and answer session now. So uh, are you there, Ruth? Maybe she's muted. Yeah, I'm turning it off now. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, go ahead, Tom. Can you help us 